Today, I'm super excited to talk to Jennifer May Nichols. She is a costume designer, and she is just super down to earth and easy to talk to. She was the costume designer for The Cabin. And then last week, I had to do a shoot with Bert, and I was so busy, I couldn't get I needed like a nice coat for outside, which I don't own because in California, it doesn't get cold enough to need a really nice coat. So she helped me find a coat and I just thought what a good conversation it would be to have to find out what a costume designer really does, what that means. What does a stylist do? What does that mean? What her path was? I'm always interested in everybody's kind of origin story, how you started and how you ended up here. So we talked about all of that. She's such a lovely person, a truly truly lovely person. Um, And I don't know, I just learned a lot about costume design. Uh, A lot of things, some things I was kind of shocked about, actually, like legitimately floored uh, that I learned today, which is disgusting. So you'll have to, you'll have to listen to the episode because I couldn't believe it. But anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode with Jennifer. Next week, I think we're releasing our book club episode, The Secret Life of Church Ladies. I am still reading this book. I haven't finished it yet. So, but it's it's a quick, easy read. So if anybody wants to join the book club, The Secret Life of Church Ladies is what we're reading. Uh, feel free to read and join us next week for that. And thank you for coming back every week. I hope you enjoy this episode with Jennifer about being a costume designer. <laughs> Thank you for doing this today. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you. I told Bert you were my guest. He was like, that's going to be such a good conversation. Oh, okay. It's going to be really great. Um, so Jennifer is a stylist. Is that right? And costume designer. And costume designer. Okay. So why don't then, then you <laughs> should, you should tell me what you do. Tell me what you do. Okay. So mainly I'm a costume designer for uh, film and television and sometimes commercials. And then um, I am also a stylist as well. Stylist is more um, when I just kind of dress people as themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, costume design is when I'm dressing a character. What's your favorite? Uh, costume design is my favorite, um, especially for television, because I get to help bring characters to life over a long period of time rather than just a short little movie. I get to, you know, help tell a story through what they're wearing. That's really cool. So then I think when people think reg- like regular people like me think costume design, I think like uh, like Queen Anne. Or, yes. you know, like, like costume, but yes. it's not just that, is it? No, it's not just that. So, um, you know, costume design spans every, like all throughout every time period, decade, modern day, you know, you look at, um, a lot of the television right now with say, um, black AF, uh, the costume designer, Michelle Cole. So, That's where it's a bit of costume design, but ever so slightly styling because it's about Kenya Barris and she's dressing him, but it's still not 100% him. So it's still a costume, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's still going into his real life. But um, I would say with costume design, modern day costumes are actually a lot harder than period costumes. I would imagine. (laughs) Because everyone has an opinion on modern day stuff, you know, oh, yeah. whereas with period, you go into the room and you're the expert. No one else knows what everything is. So right. they trust you more. <laughs> that would make more sense. Right. And that yeah. would make sense to me that it would be much easier to costume someone from a different era or even a different world like outer space yeah. or, or um, you know, post-apocalyptic Yes, which I love. You do? Yeah. (laughs) So how did you get into this field? How did you get into this? It it was a circuitous route of um, ever since I was little, I was always drawing clothes and dresses. And, you know, I was also always interested in theater. And so I had my art world and then I had my theater world. And um, 
one day, like one of my teachers was like, Hey, you know, you really should think about costume design. You're such a great artist. And, um, you know, you're so into theater too, that it could be a really good path for you. And I had never really thought of it as necessarily a job road that I would be able to take, if that makes any sense. Like I had seen, um, you know, obviously Gone with the Wind, Little Women, all of those beautiful period dramas. And I wanted to do that. I just didn't know how, like I didn't know that existed. And so that kind of opened the door for me and I completely fell in love with it. And it was definitely, you know, like <laughs> my soul made of a job because <laughs> I, I can spend all night, you know, sewing a costume or drawing and painting and rendering, um, all of that stuff. I'd rather much do that than act. <laughs> I definitely enjoy being behind the scenes more than in front of the camera. Isn't that a good indicator of you're on the right path? It's, if, if it's something you would do for free. Yes. <laughs> or if it's something that you could stay up all night to do, then you go, okay, yeah. this, I might be on the right track here. And it, it, it was good for me to have that mentality because I did do a lot for free and was right, right. All night for a long time. <laughs> you are not alone in that. I think yeah. lots of people, especially in this industry and in Hollywood in general, do a lot of stuff either yeah. for next to free or free. Yeah. But that's so cool. I'm, I'm growing up. I don't know how much you know about me, but I grew up in a really small town and it was a very narrow kind of exposure to jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many jobs out there that as I got older, I was like, oh my God, I would have been great at that job. Right? I didn't even know that job existed. I mean, yeah. I didn't even know that was on the planet. I think it's yeah. so cool now that we have the internet and so many uh, different ways to see what people do for a living. And I love yeah. to hear how people progress into what they do, especially when they love it. You're really good at what you do. So Thank Jennifer you. styled the cabin, right? Yes. Or Costume design? Is that the right word? Yeah, it's like a little bit of both for that one. <laughs> a little bit of both a for that one. <laughs> so uh, you and I talked about this the other day, but what did you get the most emails about after the cabin? So after cabin was over, I got the most emails about the infamous Ralph Lauren sweater <laughs> that Bert wore in the episode um, with Anthony Anderson yeah. and Dion Cole and uh, Jake. So that one, everyone really loved, which made me happy because that was my favorite too. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. That was a great uh, sweater. We have it in our so closet. <laughs> Such yeah, a great sweater. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, it, if times get tough, I bet you could eBay that for, you know, auction it off for quite a lot of money. <laughs> Probably. You know, the other thing, the other second thing that I got the most emails for, I don't know if you remember this, but he had kind of like, almost like a bathrobe looking thing yes. that someone that had uh, the machine graphic yeah. on the back that someone, yeah. a, a fan had just made and sent to yeah. us. Yeah, which was amazing. And I was so glad that he had that. I was like, can we use that? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So for regular people like me, so Jennifer helped me last week because we got invited to be on um, Sebastian Maniscalco's Food Network show. And I am not a clothes person. I am not a stylish person. I am a, is it comfortable person? Does it function? Is it comfortable? So I got a kind of panicked because I know that Sebastian's quite stylish and so is his mm. wife. And I thought I'm going to show up looking like Dumpy McDump and I need some help. But when I was, the reason I asked you to be a guest is I thought, there's so many applications for what you do for just the real world. It doesn't have to yeah. be because I did one episode of a show for Discovery Plus. And uh, Jennifer showed up with, uh, this was an outdoor shoot. It was going to be very cold in Topanga Canyon. It's very cold. And I didn't really have a proper winter coat. My winter coats are like, I'm going to Park City to go snow skiing. or But I don't have a like a, I'm going to go out to dinner in mm -hmm. Chicago winter coat because we don't need that in LA. I just don't have it. So yeah, we don't need it here. <laughs> no, we don't need it. I don't have wool sweaters or even really any cashmere sweaters because it just doesn't get that cold here. So Jennifer, uh, we called her and she uh, basically shopped for me and then showed up at my house and went, here are the things and here's how they go together. 
And here's how you accessorize and let's try them on and take pictures and figure out what you like. And it was so stress relieving that I thought people with a wedding, people with um, a really serious business meeting, people, there's so many different applications for your, for what you do that I don't think, I don't think people I grew up with ever thought about, well, I'll just hire a stylist, uh, you know, as the mother of the bride. But wow, it was so easy and so uh, valuable. So do you ever do that for just regular people? Yeah, I do. Often uh, friends will hire me for a day or even a week to help them with their closet and stuff. So it, it just ranges from, oh, I have an interview. Oh, I'm doing a television appearance. Or, you know, I have a bunch of appearances coming up. Or I have a bunch of um, speaking engagements. Can you help me put, you know, things together? Or I've just lost a lot of weight. Nothing in my closet fits. I really don't want to have to do this alone. <laughs> so right. I, I've gotten a, a wide range of different needs for you know, every day. And so I've done kind of the full gamut of styling for people and helping them because it is really daunting. Um, (laughs) It's really daunting. It's daunting. And if you don't love it, it's even more daunting. And um, frankly, I feel like a lot of clothing stores, especially the fitting rooms, just kind of set you up for failure as a person. How so? Like the lighting in them, it, it's just gone awful. The experience is just like you're in this cramped little room and <laughs> you're like, oh, this, like this horrible lighting is coming down on me. Like this doesn't even look like my hair color. And so it, it's just like things just don't look right on you, you know? And yeah. then you know, you don't have that other person there to bounce off of like, how does this look on me? How do I feel on this? Like what, what's going on here? So I always encourage people to just not even use the dressing room. If you have the time to take, to buy the stuff and go home and try it on first, right? just do that. <laughs> Cause yeah. to see it in your own home with all your other clothes as options to accessorize it, you're going to have a better experience. You know, it's funny you say that. There's this one store that I shop at and everything I try on in the way in the um, dressing room looks amazing. I get home and I go, why did I buy this? It looks terrible on me. Like I look terrible. I look dumpy. I look short, but I don't know if it's how she has her mirror like angled. Like it's kind of leaning against the wall. So I look longer. I literally, every time I get home and go, I look like a square. (laughs) <laughs> why did I buy this? I look terrible in this. And in the store, I think I look amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, I hate it's all that. <laughs> it's like smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yes. Yes. So they actually have their fitting room set up too good where it's not even giving you a realistic sense of what it looks like. Right. <laughs> So I mean, I've shopped there multiple it. times. It's happened to me multiple times. Like every time uh, I go there, I come home with this bag of clothes. I'm super excited about, and yeah, then I put it yeah. on at home and I go, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody I mean, should have I told me that. that. Well, yeah. you do. Yes. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> so if you shop for everybody else all the time, do you enjoy shopping for yourself? Not really. <laughs> no? <laughs> no, I like, I'm the kind of person who I'm like, I can't have nice things because I, I'm always getting down and dirty in it. Like, right. So in reference of like cabin, what you as the viewer don't see is like after Bert had his colonic, uh, and what, what happened to those robes? Who took those robes away? (laughs) I didn't know that was you. (laughs) God it was bless me your and my team. Like we, we get dirty. Like, you know, there, that, that show was a very dirty show. <laughs> and it was an intense like, show, wasn't it? It was it fast was, and furious. Like when, so with the honey, with the bee costumes, like there was honey all over that. And so oh. you just like, you're dealing with it and you, you're sticky all over. Right. So 
I just don't, I buy nice looking things at a certain price point for myself because I know that in like, maybe after one job, it's ruined. Right, (laughs) right, right. A lot of designers will spend a lot of money on their clothes, but I'm like, I go to a middle price point. (laughs) Right. That, but it's possible to look good at a middle price point, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like a lot of people are often surprised uh, when I'm wearing something and it's from Target or um, Amazon even. Like the jumpsuit I wore last week when we were yeah. doing hair fitting, that was Target from the it's clearance so cute. rack. <laughs> so cute. Thank you. So then, like- so then... If I'm going to shop at Target, what 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 should I what should I pay attention to? Like if I'm I don't even know how to ask this question. Like I had this friend once who took me shopping who was better at dressing than me. She was not a stylist, but she was very stylish. And she said, "You can't wear a crew neck. A crew neck, you need to wear, you need to have a little like see how this is a little wider than a crew yeah. or you need to have a V or you need to have yeah. a scoop." that a crew neck makes you look really wide. And I was so grateful for that because I just, I would, I just didn't know. And I was just, that just eliminated a whole Mm -hmm. uh, category of clothing for me where I was like, does it have a crew neck pass? I also (laughs) can't do like a baby doll sleeve. Oh my God. I've got farmer arms. Come on. (laughs) I got to do a sleeve or a sleeveless. I can do either one, but I can't do that. (laughs) But she told me that. And I thought that was so helpful to just have someone go, here's your do's and here's your don'ts and don't Mm -hmm. stray. And even with color, my, my, my hairstylist was like, you can never wear gray, like athletic gray. But I would say that's the only color you can't wear because you actually like your skin tone is so perfect for so many colors. It's nice. (laughs) Well, thank you. But I know when I put athletic gray on, I look yeah. like a zombie. I look like the a walking lot of people dead. Do. <laughs> and so, but he told me that. And I think she had actually told me that too. How can someone figure that out for themselves? Or can someone figure that out for themselves? I mean, it's hard, especially if you don't have just that natural kind of sensibility. You know, it it is it's a hard thing, but what I like to recommend for people, like some people go and do that whole color wheel thing. Have you heard of that before? Where yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. The color consultation, which I find that extremely limiting. And I don't really, I don't really agree with that um, personally. And um, I've had many, many people come to me as a stylist who have done the color wheel and they're like, oh, but I can't wear these. And I'm like, I'm going to prove that wrong. <laughs> <I do. laughs> Let me show you. What because I'm it's so about. limiting. Um, but it's, it's kind of, so for colors, I would say with your skin tone, if you have like, you have like a warmer skin tone, but you also have like a little yellow in there too, but it also peachy. And so your line of what you can wear is a lot broader, mm-hmm. but a lot of people with warmer skin tones just can't do that athletic cold gray. Mm-hmm. It just, it, it drowns you out and looks bad. I'm the same way. I can't wear gray <laughs> to save right. my life. It has to be like a very dark charcoal and it has to have like a warmth to it. It has to be like a redder gray instead of a bluer gray. Right. But, um, you know, your skin tone, it looks great with pastels. It looks great with um, jewel tones. Like there's just so much that you can do. But, um, you know, if you have a cooler skin tone, going towards cooler shades or cooler tones of clothing is going to be better for that person. So it's kind of looking at, you know, your undertones of your skin to inform, like everyone can do a yellow, but there's different variations of yellow. There's cool yellows, there's warm yellows. So going with the warm or coolness of your skin, I think is the best way to go because, you know, I don't like limiting people on a color, just the kind of color. (laughs) That's good advice. What this friend yeah. told me to do was to take, I wish I had like a shirt. Oh, I have these hats. I'll use Bert's hat. To ha- take a color and hold it next to me and see yeah. how it changed my face. Yes. Because then if you like put the wrong, like here's kind of a gray, it'll look 
Well, that's yeah. not right because it's white. But <laughs> I would do that in the store. I'd like hold up a shirt and go and see what it did to the color of my face. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really helpful. Yeah. Um, Cause then I'd go, Oh my God, I look dead. I can't wear that. Or, or, Oh my God, that look, my skin would just pop and like wake mm -hmm. up with some yeah. colors. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, what would you say about, I have a hard time shopping because everything hits me in the wrong place. Right. So like I have to pull my, my shoulders up. If I pull my shoulders up and folded them, it would hit me perfect from there down. <laughs> <laughs> So does that mean I'm a petite? I, I really do think you're a petite. Having um, having done the fitting last week and like seeing you, you're you're definitely more on the petite side. And for you, I think like you as a person just in general should be dressing around your waist. Like you're you have a teeny tiny little waist, you know? And so if you dress things that are more of a boxy shape you kind of lose your figure in it. Mm. And like, we saw that with a few like of the coats and some of the sweaters and stuff that you need something just a little bit more fitted to show off your figure and not hide it. Okay. This brings up a really good point because I do not have a perfect figure. I, I am not overweight, like crazy fat or whatever, but I don't have a supermodel figure. I am very curvy, right? I've got a little bitty waist, but baby got back. You have the curves, but that's yeah. a good thing. <laughs> that's not a bad I got thing. this, but I try to hide. I tried to hide the, like, I have muffin top issues. I just do. As do most people. Like, as do most do. people. That's my yeah. point. I'm just a regular shaped person. I'm yeah. not, I mean, I work out to stay healthy, mm -hmm. but I also don't eat great. So, I mean, I eat okay, but I'm definitely not. I mean, I'm a regular shaped person. I think mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not a fancy pants person. So I try to hide my flaws by mm -hmm. wearing the boxy because I have like, this is gross, but I have like back fat and then like yeah. upper butt fat. Uh -huh. That's where I hold my fat is in my back and my upper butt, not even mm -hmm. my butt. It's above mm -hmm. my butt. It's muffin top and then bra area. Mm -hmm. I hate it. So then if I wear something fitted, I am so self-conscious of the back of my body that I'd just rather box myself out and then, and, that, and then yeah. I don't have to worry about it, but you are so right. I actually look so much bigger in that boxy yeah. cut yes. than I actually am. Cause I have big boobs too. I don't have small boobs. Yeah. I got big boobs. So then I put a box on and I look like a square again, <laughs> just a little square troll, <laughs> but it's hard to, it's hard to kind of split the difference. There aren't a lot of fashions that aren't like if you buy a t-shirt, they're either a box or they're that yeah. like baby doll. Or it's cat. like so thin that you're like, I feel really uncomfortable with this. That I'm an extra large. And, yeah. and you know, yeah. and in the box cut, I'm a small. But when they get in that baby doll, it makes yeah. me so frustrated. I'm like, there's gotta be a loose baby doll. Can't we get some yeah. kind of loose baby doll going on? Right. It, it, it is frustrating. I feel like for t-shirts, at least J. Crew's a little bit better with that. It's like they have their boyfriend fit tee, but it's still like a little more on the like slim boyfriend instead of the oversized boyfriend kind Super of Super boxy. Yeah. So but where are your favorite places to shop? I mean, hilariously, in the, in the world of boxy clothing and <laughs> things not fitting properly, I love anthropology. Right? Um, you know, Nothing fits me from there. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really hard to get a right fit from there <laughs> to the point where, like, I, even for myself and for other people, I'll buy like six things and one of them will work. <laughs> right. But they do, they have such interesting clothing um, and, you know, it's easy to shop and return there. They don't like, you know, give you a hard time if you buy the six things and only keep one. Right. So I love them because it's unique clothing. At, they're a little higher on the price point than the average, you know, person wants to spend, but their sales section is really good. Yeah, so, it is. I'll, I'll often, you know, I don't go to the regular priced areas for stuff. I go to the sales section and find some gems in there. Um, 
Yeah. So I love anthropology just because the funky artist in me (laughs) enjoys that stuff. And it's easy um, to tell a character from some of their pieces costume wise, like you can put something in one of their shirts and it helps the audience know right away who that person is if they don't really have a whole lot of dialogue. So I enjoy it like professionally and personally. Um, I love J. Crew for the classics um, and that they have a good size range as well. Um, but I also enjoy Nordstrom Rack for uh, getting things on a budget, <laughs> like a very, very small budget, but some really cool stuff and some nice designer things. Like your coat um, was a Ralph Lauren coat that we found, and it I can't remember the original price. I think it was like three or four hundred dollars, but I found it for eighty, which right. is. And, and it's a beautiful coat. coat. Yeah. And it's going to last yeah. <laughs> for, for, for a very long time. Yes. So I feel like that's where, that's a really good deal. So mm. I, I had found some All Saints coats uh, at Nordstrom Rack and they, they were in the hundred dollar range, which is also a really great thing. So Nordstrom Rack is a great place to, if you're on a budget, um, but trying to find some nice clothes to go because they also, they have petite, they have regular, they have plus size, they run the gamut on it. So, and their, their app is pretty good too. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I've never used their app. Um, I love Nordstrom Rack, but I, like I said to you, I don't ever shop. I, I don't ever shop. And I have to say like shopping at Nordstrom Rack is not a pleasurable experience. <laughs> right. Right. It's a full day, isn't it? You have to block out like three hours. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, just to check out, you have to block out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, you know, it's not for people who don't shop a lot and don't like to shop. It's not great. And that's why I say, you know, go on the app instead if you're looking for stuff um, or their website, because I'm pretty sure shipping and returns are free that way as well. That's great. But something that's like, it makes it a little more affordable and accessible. That's good. That's good to know. Yeah. I know I I avoid shopping at all costs. I actually joined Stitch Fix because I was like, for my podcast, I, I was like, I have six blouses. So mm-hmm. I need, I need like tops because you don't really see my bottoms. Yeah. But you, I need, I need tops. I just need you to send me tops, 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 tops. And then I figured out they kind of are all the same top in a different fabric. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I, don't, I already have this top. I just have the same exact top. I don't want another one of this top. So I'm kind of struggling with Stitch Fix a little bit, but, yeah. um, but what is hard helpful hard. about that company for me is that I feel like I've gone shopping without shopping and then I can just return anything I don't want. And, um, so at least I have, I have some influx of possibilities. I'm the worst. I am so not a girl in that way. I just don't like shopping. So I found what you said really interesting in that a character's costume, especially one that doesn't have a lot of dialogue, their, their costume can really inform who they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think people watching a movie realize how important that is to the story. Yeah. And I feel like that's actually when costume design is at its best. If like you just kind of, you notice the character, you, you don't necessarily focus on what they're wearing. You're not picking apart everything, but you, you take in their look and you're like, Oh, I know who this person is. Right. You know, yeah, so that person walks in, orders a coffee. You know who that person is without them telling you anything. Right, and that's what I love about my job. <laughs> that's great, and that's so fascinating. I just don't think it's something anybody really thinks about. You take for granted that the guy ordering coffee is just maybe wore his own clothes, but that yeah. it was really chosen and purposeful. And um, that's so cool. What a cool job! What was your favorite thing you've ever worked on? I have a lot of favorites, like I have. Yeah, I have like, they're all my babies. I'm <laughs> you know, sure. Like, they're all my children. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's hard to define like specific ones. Like I, like I loved working on Cabin because it was such a unique experience and it was so different than a lot of things. And 
it had such great people on it and conversations and also just the sheer wackiness of it. Like I've never <laughs> laughed as much on a job as I laughed on That's Kevin. awesome. That's really awesome. <laughs> like, I mean, we, me and my team, we were like laughing and so we cried. Most of the time we had our hands like over our mouths so we wouldn't ruin a take. It, you know, <laughs> So like for that end of it, like that was just so much fun that like, that's that. And then, um, I did a show on Fox called what just happened. Um, and, and then we did a spoof on the masked singer and I had to create like five insane <laughs> costumes, like an elephant, a lobster, a praying mantis, a a carrot and a pigeon and they all had like attributes like elegant elephant so I actually made this elephant that was kind of like a cross between um Queen Elizabeth and Queen Anne oh my god <laughs> like, you know so and that was you know pretty much all custom made with me and my team and that was just so much fun that I love that and then um Another show that I did for the CW was called Containment, which in the world we live in right now, it feels like my art has come to life because I've seen I something bet. that I did for that show in <laughs> real life now. But it it is like a post-apocalyptic world of a when a viral outbreak happens and it's a deadly one. And so that like just getting to do we did every walk of life for that, which I loved. I loved like doing rich people, poor people, gangs, policemen. I, like it was just a little bit of everything, but then taken to this other degree because there is this deadly virus that is, you know, ravaging the world. And so like taking all of that into context and, you know, people, are fearing for their lives. They're trying to protect themselves and wearing whatever makeshift protective gear they can get. Um, that was really fun. And one of the things I did was uh, I de like I took apart a bra and I made that into a mask. <laughs> and my crew thought I was crazy for it. And I was like, look, if there is a virus out there that's going to kill you, you're not caring about the lady you're protecting your face. And if yeah, totally. all you have is a bra to do it, you're going to use that bra. Heck yeah. And I've seen people doing that. <laughs> no way. Yes. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, I wasn't that crazy. A uh, trendsetter. <laughs> trendsetter. <Yeah. laughs> so it's, yeah. I mean, every, everything I work on, I do have something that I especially love. Like I love, you know, custom building clothing for um characters like doing the mass singer spoof was amazing but I also love to have fun and do crazy things like with bird or just get down and dirty and do post-apocalyptic kind of stuff too so that's so cool it's amazing to me how much of Hollywood is creative problem solving yes <laughs> you you are presented with a creative idea and you have to problem solve to reach that goal um, it's it's obviously a massive amount of creativity, but there's so much kind of logic and thinking and and math, and there's so much more than just being creative in Hollywood. There's so much problem solving that happens. Uh, I think that's why uh, some of the brightest people come here to work behind the camera like you, because where can you apply all that creativity and problem solving? What other industry, maybe like um, architecture or interior mm -hmm. design or, you know, especially if you're doing an interior design or a remodel of something that's existing where you have to problem solve it. But there, it feels like there's not that many careers that allow you uh, uh, extreme creativity yeah. and also extreme problem solving, which to me, I love the combination of those two things. I love when yeah. I get a script and Bert says, read this and tell me, give me some notes. And I'll go, here's all the problems. Here's how you fix them. Take it or leave it. But that's so fun because you get mm -hmm. to use kind of both sides of your brain, right? Yes. That's really, uh, 
I think that is one of the reasons people come here is because yeah. they don't have anywhere else to have that kind of two side of the brain outlet all the time. Yeah. Um, I feel like I definitely thrive in this kind of environment and in a bit of the chaos, especially mm -hmm. with television, because it's a new script every week or every few days. Um, and they're constantly rewriting everything. So there's, it is constant problem solving and there's actually a lot of psychology that goes into it too with costume design, psychology of thinking about the characters, but then also psychology with the actors and actresses as well. Mm. And, you know, I bet. Things. And um, yeah. And so it really does get to work my brain in every possible little way, which I love. I, yeah. I just love, I love, I'm the weird person who's like, Hey, uh, we just got these 10 changes in the script and Oh, it all films tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> how do we figure this out? We <laughs> can do it amazing at the same time. <laughs> so what quality of human being do you think that is? Is it perseverance? Is it a hard worker? Is it what do you think makes that person who, because that also fascinates me about people is some people go, I will put my head down and push through anything you give me at any time, mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And some people don't have that. Why? Any idea why you think that is? That's a great question. <laughs> I ask that question to myself yeah. all the time. Why do, because I have a put your head down and push through mentality, 100%. Mm -hmm. And then when people tell me they're, they're tapped out, they just can't do it, I go, but why? Why? Yeah. That's a choice. You're choosing to tap out. But yeah. are they really, or is that just because? Or is it just built in them? Like. Or built in us. Yeah. They yeah. never stop. What is healthy? What's unhealthy? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Am yeah. I the unhealthy one that goes, no, just push, 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 push. I often think that I'm the one who's just like that because I'm even, I'll tell my crew, I'm like, you guys, you need to tell me when you need a break. You need to like say, hey, Jen, we're, we're going to eat lunch now because I'm the kind of person who will just work through lunch. Like I'm not not someone who takes breaks. I am not someone who often says no, like I'm pretty much usually up for the challenge and we'll figure it out one way or another. Um, but I do think you have to have that kind of flexibility to be successful out here. <laughs> so now do you think you were always that way? Were you always yes. not take a break? Yeah. Like, because I, Actually, my dad's a lot like that too. Like he is a constant kind of worker and he doesn't like to sit. And I am the same way. I don't like to sit. <laughs> right. I like to be on my feet and doing things. And, um, and so I do think that it is something innate in me. Like, I mean, as a kid, I could not sit still in school. I mean, I'm pretty sure I have some form of like ADD or ADD. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could not sit still like and I would get done with the work in school so soon that I would be like give me something else or I would read chapters ahead in the books for school mm -hmm. and I would be like going and going and going and not stop so like even at night after I was done with homework I would have like five different books that I would be reading at once kind of thing so I think it is just like an innate sense in me even during COVID whether like there's not a lot happening right now you know in my world at least right. and so but I still have like six different things I'm working on you know? <laughs> so that's great do you I see yourself heard. doing this forever or yes. is there some other goal like I eventually want to have my own line of headbands I don't know <laughs> Is there and that would be fun. Um, this is like part of the goal. So one of the things that um, my husband's a writer and he mostly writes for television, but our long-term goal together is to have like, technically we have our own production company, but we've done one thing. <laughs> so, and it's been successful. It's been a, like a good, successful little thing to do. And, um, but what we want to continue to do is grow together and 
be the kind of like Baz Luhrmann and Catherine Marshall um, and like Ronald D. Moore and his wife, Terry Dreisbach. Like they're the costume designers, but they're also creative um, inputs. They help produce, they help make it happen. Kind of like in a non-married sense, Ryan Murphy and Lou Eyrick. Mm-hmm. Lou Eirich had always worked as Ryan's costume designer and now he's elevated her to a position where she both produces on his shows as well as costume designs and that's something that we want to move forward together because I for every single script he writes just like with you <laughs> I'm reading I'm giving notes I'm telling him how to make it better <laughs> and giving him junk uh, joke punch-ups and things like that and um even with the film that we made together, I ended up helping to direct different parts and things like that. So it's just something that we're growing on together. And so once the pandemic is over, (laughs) we have a few projects that we want to make. And so that's kind of like the long-term goal, which is still costume design, but just in a bit more of a, you know, overall sense too. Right. Costume design plus. Yes. Plus this other thing. That's great. I think that's great. You work so hard that it'll happen. Yes. It's already happened. It's happened once. It'll happen, exactly. if it'll happen once. It'll happen again. Right. And and we didn't kill each other. That's good. <laughs> so I feel, you know, I feel like we're, we're good. We've been together for 15 years now. And so it's one of those, okay, that didn't break us. I feel good and confident that we can keep moving forward anybody who makes it through covid i think yeah. is smooth sailing after that to live in a house with somebody i mean bert didn't even live here before covid not really i saw him like two days a week and then one week a month and when he sh- when he we we keep saying okay we've had very minimal fights mm-hmm. uh, so as good as we thought our marriage was before I think we're actually really good because we can yeah. we can actually live together and not kill each other. I thought I thought by like two months in, I would have like stabbed him in his sleep. <laughs> See, he is such a slob. As you know, you've been in his closet. He is a disaster and he is difficult to live with. But somehow we've been able to kind of manage it. So you yeah, made it through I- the pandemic with him. Yeah, I I definitely feel like the pandemic has made our marriage stronger. I mean, we've been together 15 years, but this is the most time we've ever spent together. Like everybody else, I think. Yeah. And like, because a lot of times, you know, I'm almost like, not in the uh, sloppiness way, <laughs> but I'm the bird in the family <laughs> because I'm not home a lot. Um, I'll be on location. Like I'll be in Atlanta for six months filming or in Pittsburgh or Louisiana. I mean, I've been everywhere just off filming and he's left here. And so often I'm, I'm not around. <laughs> and so right. it's kind of really great to just have this time together. Um, like we've been definitely taking it in a let's look at the blessings in this you know and try to enjoy that when there's just so much crap going on we have done the same thing we've tried to really just enjoy our kids even though you know it would be better for them to be in school we've been trying to enjoy that they have lunch here every day yeah you know to try and kind of glass half full the whole thing yeah as best yeah. you can. Um, exactly. Has there ever been a job that you've quit that you've been like, I surrender, I can't complete? Um, <laughs> yes, but not in this field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I grew up on the outskirts of Pittsburgh um, where there also weren't a lot of like job opportunities and understanding like the world around you kind of thing. Um, and <laughs> When I was 18, I was a uh, a shift manager at Taco Bell. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we also had a lot of people that were working for me um, under work release. Oh, boy. And, uh, and I, you know, uh, an 18-year-old girl, um, being the boss of uh, 
people who have been through a lot in their life. <laughs> right, right. In different ways. I mean, and like I was the youngest person working there and I was a manager. And That's so crazy. you can imagine how maybe some people resented that. Um and did not respond well to me trying to show authority. <laughs> right. What did you learn from that job? Oh, I learned that I never wanted to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Other than that, <laughs> did you learn anything that, valuable that carried into your uh, current life? I, I learned that I have more patience than I realized mm. that I'm an extremely patient and perseverant person. And it actually like that, I quit that job, but it was, it took me a really long time to quit it because I'm not a quitter, you know? <laughs> Right, right. I I am just not someone who gives up on things. Um, like, I mean, it, it just applies in every kind of way to me. And so that perseverance, I think, is what I learned of, okay, but this wasn't right for me. So you don't need to keep persevering in it. Right, right. The lesson <laughs> has been isn't good. Thing yeah, holding let's, on to. This is learned. Let's move on like, to something else. Yeah. I think it's so valuable for um keep thinking about my kids because I have, you know, a 16-year-old. And she asked us in the pandemic if she could get a job. And we were like, mm -hmm. no, you can't have a job in the pandemic. I applaud that you want to have a job. That's amazing. And if we were not in a pandemic and your grades were great and you were participating in high school like a normal high school kid, sure, you could get a job at Starbucks or wherever. But I just think back to when I was that age and I started working for my dad when I was 13 and I worked for him. You did? I worked for my stepdad, but then I also did um, work outside of that too. Like mm -hmm. I, I started when I was 12, you yeah. know, doing stuff. It's, it's, it's an interesting shift when you shift away from working from a family member into working mm -hmm. for someone random, someone else. Yeah. Um, it, the work is valuable both ways, but, but I, I, I watch my kids move through life and I think, uh, back to my own experience as a young, young adult, um, and how many jobs I had that were like a shift manager at Taco Bell where you go, I stayed there way longer than I needed to, and I endured way more than I should have, and my God, what I learned from it. I learned so yeah. much from it. I think people don't, uh, some young people don't realize that that's kind of what you're supposed to do with life. Yes. You're supposed to take some shit jobs mm -hmm. and figure out how to work, mm -hmm. you know, figure out how to work, not how to have a career. Those are two different things. Because yeah. when you have a career and you don't know how to work, you won't know really how to sustain your career. Yes. Right? <laughs> you can only go so far. That's right. Because you won't have that push through, do something I don't want to do, meet a deadline yeah. I didn't set, do something that's impossible, not because I said so, but because someone else did. Those yeah. things are so valuable, um, invaluable, actually. So, yeah, I, I'm always fascinated to hear about people's early jobs because- yeah. We all had them. Well, <laughs> almost everybody had them. And, you know, I I worked at a Blockbuster video. I, yeah. um, I sold wedding gowns for uh, awesome. when I was in college. I was in the proof department at the bank, which is a nightmare where you're like, <laughs> you get the deposit slip and you type in $100 and then you get the check and you read it and you go $100. <laughs> that balances for eight hours a day. For yeah. eight, it was the most monotonous yeah. job. But do you know what I learned from that job? You got to do what you got to do because that's your job. So for mm -hmm. eight hours a day, you look at deposit slips and checks for eight hours a day. Yeah. And there were women who had worked in that department for like 30 years. And I thought to myself, this is mind numbing. Like somebody take me out back and shoot me. I can't be here for 30 years. Like I can do this. I was paying my way through college. Yeah. So I, I was doing that to get promoted to be a teller. Yeah. Right. I never got promoted. I gave up. <laughs> I never made it out of the basement proof department. It was terrible. That's probably for the best. <laughs> it was for the best. I moved on. I think I don't yeah. even remember what my next job was, but I was like, uncle. 
I cry uncle. I can't sit in this room with no windows and look at deposit slips for eight hours anymore. I did it for a long time yeah. though. Like you, I did it for like something like eight or nine months. It was yeah. a long, was long there, time. I was there almost a year. And I mean, I've had so many of those weird, weird jobs. Um, I mean, I sold Tupperware for a little while. I sold Avon. I sold Avon. <laughs> Oh, you know, <laughs> I do. I sold and, Avon. Yes. I totally know Tupperware. Yeah. And like, I just, I, I had a lot of like weird little temp jobs here and there too. Cause you're like, when you're working to pay your way through school, you will take whatever you can and you will hold down multiple jobs at a time to just get yourself through. And, you know, it paid off for me because, you know, I, I paid my way through school and then I was able to get into grad school from all of the hard work that I did and into a really good grad school that only takes three costume design candidates a year. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And I got a scholarship. So it wasn't a full scholarship, but it was pretty up there. And so it, you know, all of that hard work then paid off. Right. So it, it allowed me to be able to go to grad school. Thank goodness. <laughs> I know it's so, you know, I had this, um, I was an actor for a short period of time and I had this acting teacher who said, you should really love your day job. Really love it. Not because you're never going to be an actor, okay. <laughs> but because, or not because you're never going to make it, but because of the gratitude you owe that mm -hmm. job yes. for paying your bills. Mm -hmm. And I think that can apply to a college student that could apply mm -hmm. to someone who's trying to get their entrepreneurial business off the ground to love your day job, not yeah. to love it to the point that you're trapped in it, yes. but to love it to the point where it's not making you miserable, absolutely miserable. Because I know when that acting teacher told me that I thought I'm going to have a totally different perspective than on my waiting tables job. Mm -hmm. And, and when I go to work, happy to be there and grateful that it's paying my bills, it affects my, uh, my mood and how I treat my customers. And I'm sure how much I got paid. Yeah. And then you don't go home like bitter and angry and shitty, you know, and resentful, yeah. nasty. Just that simple statement really made me shift my mindset. Not that I was ever a miserable, I've always been a pretty positive person, mm -hmm. but who likes to wait tables? I mean, not yeah. a lot of people go, you know, my dream job is. <laughs> yeah. No one enjoys cleaning the toilets at Taco Bell. <laughs> no, for sure. But there is something about your mindset, I think, that if you can affect your mindset yeah. so that you're happier as a human as you move through your shift manager at Taco Bell. Yes. It makes that time. I think you can also reflect on that time and realize what you learned from it as yeah. opposed to resenting your way through it. And then when it's over, you're like, thank God that's dead. And you have no perspective on, well, wow, I learned that I'm really patient. I learned that I, I can persevere through anything. I learned that I have a stick to itness that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. Those things are really valuable. Yeah. That's one reason why I'm all for people starting to work at a younger age, because I feel like it's a building block, you know, that it's also a chance to screw up. <laughs> You know, right. while there are little consequences and learn from your mistakes before you're in a high pressure situation, you know, I feel yeah. like jobs like that are just so important to help shape you as a human in general and right. keep you going on a life path that, you know, might not be the same as where you started, but it's, it informs everything that you do later on and you're going to be better for it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I I was super proud of Georgia for asking for a job. I, I was know, really, awesome. really proud. I this was like, rare out here in LA too. I don't know a lot of like teenagers working and I'm like, get those kids out there. Yeah, right. I'm, I was all for it. But her dad was like, are you kidding me? It's a pandemic. There's no yeah, way. Nah, You're not leaving I mean, the house. <laughs> you know, and then we did offer her a job for us because we, you know, we have T-shirts and merchandise for Bert's yeah. that we sell on his online store. And we're like, you can go work for your aunt. She runs our online merchandise. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, that's she different. really wanted to be independent. And I'm yeah. really proud of that. Yeah, that's just really bad awesome. timing, bad timing. And I feel bad that she doesn't get to step into that world. 
until she's a lot older because of the yeah. stupid pandemic. It's just yeah. unfortunate. And Bert was like, you know, people are out of work everywhere. We can't have you take a job from someone. <laughs> I mean, this is that that is very true as well. Yeah. Yes. He was. I didn't even think about it that way. Yeah. I just thought about it. The health <laughs> implications yeah. of it. And he was like, there's so many people who actually need that we job need it, and you yeah. don't need that job. So that's true. we can push pause and you can get your job at Starbucks when all this has calmed down and, and kind of regulated and gone back to kind of a balanced way of life mm -hmm. and then, then go get your job. Isla has no inclination to get a job <laughs> at all. <laughs> I think her job would be, can I be in a sleep study program <laughs> and you pay me to sleep? I think that's her job entirely. Can you pay me to drink soda? And <laughs> do that. There are jobs for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> I know Bert one time got offered like $300. This was a long time ago before he was, obviously before he was making much money as a comic to um, play video games all day, like as a market oh. research Mm -hmm. but he had to be there at like eight in the morning. And he was like, pass, I'm not in there. I can't do it. And I was, he, I was dating him at the time. And I was like, what do you mean pass? It's $300 to play. And he was like, I'm not going to be there at eight o'clock in the morning. And I thought, oh my God, what a privileged, you are broke, buddy. You need to go play video games for 300 bucks. He never went because he'd have to be there. And that's, that might be, that might be Isla Kreischer. She might go, I'll pass on the money because I just, you know, I, I can't get up that early. Early, yeah. It's not going to work. She'd have to be the night shift manager at Taco Bell. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're the ones who show up at four o'clock in the morning. Yes. Yeah. I show up when you say on time, five minutes early. Yeah. Um, George is that way too. But those other two ninnies I live with are not so much. <laughs> Not so much, but that's why Bert is the he's the he's the talent. He's you know the actor, the comedian, so he can show up at ten a.m. You know when like we've been there since <laughs> five. <laughs> I could never do that. He he does do that. You know he used to have a call time for his Travel Channel shows. It was seven a.m. and he'd go. Yeah, why? Yeah. Were you gonna have me sit on set for two hours? No, I'll show up at nine. I would never yeah. do that. <laughs> I would never do that. I'd be like seven. No problem. I'll be there. And yeah. I'll sit there for two hours and read a book because you told me to. I'm just don't have that kind of rule breaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have it. I don't have it. Is there a dream person you would like to work for? Do you have a director or writer or producer that you would just okay, love to uh, work for? Director. Yes. Taika Waititi. I... Who is that? So he... I know him from his, you know, smaller endeavors before he got big, but, um, he, he directed Jojo Rabbit. Um, he directed okay. Thor, um, some of his smaller things like hunt for the world of people. Um, uh, he did, um, just a whole bunch of other stuff that like my brain is, you know, trying to put the words together and it's not working what we do in the shadows, stuff like that. So, and uh, he's from New Zealand and, just some of his earlier stuff is so quirky and wonderful and hilarious and character driven deliciousness, like hunt for the wilder people. I watched on a plane to um, Thailand. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and like, it was something that I had been wanting to see. And then, Oh, there it's right in front of me. Oh my gosh. I bawled my eyes out on the plane. <laughs> like, I was not expecting it to be such an emotional journey oh yeah it was people were like is she okay <laughs> like, oh my gosh crying I'm not someone who wants to cry on a plane no but nobody wants to cry on a plane yeah no but there I was um so just a lot of his work really speaks to me and he has kind of a quirky you know sensibility that I think goes would go well with my quirky sensibility right, and right. so he he is someone that I would love to work with. Um, actor wise, I would say Gary Oldman is someone I've always wanted to work with because he's just so great at transforming himself into any role. And he has such a respect for costume design and um, a love for it as well that he's someone that I think I would enjoy working with. Um, but dream jobs like, there's there's so many <laughs> right you know but uh like 
if I could do uh, a Game of Thrones spinoff or one of those Lord of the Rings spinoffs, those that would be amazing. Like, yeah. you know, I, there's so much that I would love to do. I love period. I love fantasy. I love sci-fi, you know, a little bit of anything. That's so cool. <laughs> so cool. So, um, you don't have to name any names. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had anybody that you worked for that was just a nightmare? Like, Actor wise, I would say there have been like just a few. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, <laughs> there's some people who definitely um, don't understand hygiene too. What? <laughs> what does that mean? Doesn't understand hygiene? What do you mean? They would come to work like dirty? Um, or just not um, like maybe that they forget that we take care of their underwear. What? What do you mean? Wait, you take care of that. Wait a minute. Hold on. You take care of people's underwear? Yeah. <laughs> like at the end of the day, like we're the ones who get their underwear and stuff. But why? Why can't they take care of their own underwear? Uh, well, often it's to make sure that they have underwear for the next day. Because <laughs> so many actors will come for fittings not having underwear whatsoever. Um And if we left it up to them to have underwear to bring to set, it just like they wouldn't have it. So, um. okay. You have just blown my mind. (laughs) You do not leave your house without panties on. People don't wear panties. Are you talking about panties or are you talking about bras? I'm talking, I mean, bras happen too, but mainly panties. Who leaves the house without panties on? Uh, And and men and women. Everyone does it. (laughs) I mean, Bert doesn't wear underwear. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> but even though I, was I like, mean, happy to provide mean, something. Wait, what do you mean a hygiene? Are people like having their period in their underwear? It's not just women, it's men too who just, men have their periods? I'm not just, no. <laughs> <laughs> How about their backsides? <laughs> I can't believe that. I would be so embarrassed. I would never give you that underwear. Right, you would think, but no. That underwear would end up in the garbage. <laughs> you would think, but no. That's terrible. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god, I can't so, believe that. If there are any actors or actresses watching this, <laughs> know that we are happy to provide sanitary <laughs> products for you. Like I always keep them in my kit just in case. And if you have an accident, maybe just let us know ahead of time. Um, just say, hey, I'm going to be taking my underwear home today. Um, if you guys have any extra, that might be better to provide. You can say it nicely. You don't have to say what happened. Just, just give us a little heads up. Oh my goodness (laughs) gracious. I cannot believe this. That's just crazy. Yeah. Our, so my job and my team's job, it's, there is a lot of grossness that happens. Give me some more grossness. What's the other grossness? Uh, There's a lot of people who just don't um, shower or wear uh, deodorant a lot. And so we have, we, we deal with a lot of, that kind of stuff also people who like just don't take care of foot issues as well and like what do you mean foot issues like athlete's foot (laughs) like foot fungal issues and stuff who are these people that don't take care of their body surprisingly a lot of a lot of actors and actresses um i you know, are more focused on other things than their person. Um, and so we end up taking care of a lot of that stuff. And that's also where the psychology aspect of my job comes in. <laughs> I'd say so for your own self. How do you talk yourself off the ledge? And my crew. <laughs> oh my God. Or to gently, you know, be like, hey, is everything okay for you? Because, you know, like w- when that much stuff is happening, you're like, oh, what, what is going on there? Because like, do, are they not self-aware to know what's happening? Like, do they maybe need someone to talk to? <laughs> like, you know. A therapist? Yeah. Which, you know, can sometimes end up being me. Uh, <laughs> How bizarre. I would never, I can't imagine showing up somewhere stinky or yeah. dirty. I mean, maybe you don't shave your legs, but 
that that we don't care about unless yeah. you're wearing a skirt in the seam. Yeah, right, 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 right. Like, if you don't want to shave, you don't want to shave your armpits. Like, some designers might care. I, I shouldn't say we don't care. I don't care. Like, right. if you do you unless it doesn't work for the character. Right, right, right. You know? Or for me and my nose. Oh, my God. I can't <laughs> yeah. believe that people do that. Yeah. So do you feel, because I feel... I feel like some people might treat you like you're invisible. Mm -hmm. Does does that happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're often the last department to learn about anything. Like, big changes could be happening, and they just kind of forget about costumes. Why? (laughs) Tell us. Um, A lot of us have the theory that it is because we are one of the female-based departments. Mm. Like, we have a lot of male costume designers. And even on Cabin, like, two of the guys on my team are men. Um, We have a lot of men, but people just look at it as, oh, it's clothing. So that's women's work. And so Same as hair and makeup, probably, right? Same as hair with hair and makeup, probably. Yeah. And so we often don't get told things until the last minute or not at all. And and then we're like, wait, why didn't anyone tell us? Um, Yeah. So there, there is a lot of that unseenness to it and that people think, Oh, well, they just shop for a living. So they don't do real work, you know, that kind of mentality. And it's like, yes, I do shop, but that is not all I do. That is, that is a very small percentage of what I do. So. Yeah. What you do is craft. You're crafting. Yeah. Right. Yes. Part of the character. Yes. You know. And a lot of that isn't even just shopping. A lot of it can be custom made. A lot of it is, you know, finding the right fabric, finding the right patterns, finding the right elements and having the jewelry made and all of that. It's, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot of preparation discussion. I mean, you can go through 20 different designs for one character before you land on one thing. And that character has 50 more changes. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. Shopping is a very small (laughs) part of it. And that that tends to be what people think of when they think of our department. Right. Right. I'm glad you said that because I think you're right. I think most people think it's a lot of shopping. And, And I mean, when you, when we did our one day on the cabin, we came in and you had like outfits. This mm-hmm. this go this goes together with these shoes, with these jeans, and it's very well thought out. It's not. Mm-hmm. It, it is a plan. Like yes. anytime you have a plan for anything you're doing, even a picnic, and you come up with a plan, mm-hmm. there's effort involved and th- and thought yes. and um and planning. But I I mean, everything was just. Not only was it paired right? Like jeans and, and accessories and whatever. It was all steamed. It was yeah. all ready to put on. Yes. <laughs> if something needed to be altered, it was done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just don't think people realize people in the, like regular people who aren't in this movie industry realize what a, a kind of a comprehensive job it is. Yeah. Like one example on cabin would be, um, and I think you know how we kept kind of changing what we were going to do every day. <laughs> yes, I do. A lot. Yes. And we weren't really sure, even on the day. Yes. <laughs> some of the things that were going to happen. Or on the hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it was a very like fly by the seat of your pants, which I thrive in. I do really well with that. But um, the night before the, uh, the bee stuff, we found out we were going to be doing it. And I think originally it had been planned for other people. Um, Like, I don't think it was originally with Dion and Anthony and Jay. Um, And, you know, Dion, Anthony, Jay and Bert are, you know, not small men. No, they're large in stature and in girth. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And so I had these one size fits all B things and like we bought extra of them because we didn't know, like I said, who, when, how, what, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of it. 
And um, they're like, okay, we're doing this the next day. And so I had some of the guys in our department put the bee things on and they were a little tight. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that night I went home after we were done and I altered all of the beekeeper costumes. Oh my God. I don't think anyone actually on the crew knew that. <laughs> wow. Like, I, I put, um, inserts into the legs and the shirts and uh, wow. so that they would fit and thank god i did because otherwise they would not have fit them no but that's like that's that kind of you know that weirdness of things that go unseen mm-hmm. uh, but it's the it thankless happen. pieces because no yeah. one even knows to say thank you because yeah. you just get it done yeah exactly and done. move on to the next thing <laughs> right So if there was a young person listening today Mm -hmm. and they thought this is something, I live in a small town. I didn't know this job existed. This is something that I think I would be really good at. What should they do? What I would say first is um, if you, like, especially if it's small town, if there, if you guys have a community theater in your town, go to them, see if they need help on any other shows right now. Obviously that's not happening. (laughs) Right. Um, in the near future in the near future yeah go to the small theater see if they need any help on any productions like you probably won't start out costume designing it you'll probably start out as like the costume crew where you help the actors get ready before a show and you take care of their their undergarments after the show <laughs> aren't you so excited <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it starts um, <laughs> and even 20 years later in your career, they'll be doing it. Um, but, but in all honesty, it's like, it, you know, it is where you start. And, um, and if you enjoy doing that, then I would say start seeing what more you can do of like, can you um, start designing for them? Seeing if there's any like film productions that are coming into your town, because even small towns are getting film productions now. Um, One of the ways that I figured out that I wanted to do film and television over theater was Pittsburgh started getting a lot of film shoots in it. And so I went and helped out on those and discovered that I really loved the pace of it. Like with theater, you get, you know, at least five weeks of preparation before a play And that's wonderful. And I do love that. But (laughs) there's, I also like the craziness of, okay, something's happening tomorrow and we need to make it happen, you know? Right. right. So I enjoyed that aspect of it. So like, it's good to find out which aspect of costume world you you would fall into best um, by doing both theater and a little film and television. I mean, there's all kinds of, little shoots happening in um, just everywhere. And so looking on websites like um, mandy.com, you can go and see like little jobs here and there for indie films or even just little small shoots that are coming through towns and stuff like that to just go and help out on for the day and see if that's something that you enjoy. And then from there, it's one of those, if you really love it, you can go the route like I did, which is getting an education in it. And then some people just <laughs> don't do that, which is okay too. You can, you know, move to one of the bigger hubs like LA, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, um, you know, even in Louisiana. Like there's a lot of places now where there's a lot going on, even New Mexico. So getting your feet wet in that way. By like apprenticing or? Yeah. Like, you know, if you start out interning at the community theater and then right. like work your way up, you know, in the costume world, you would start out like in my costume world, you would start out as a costume production assistant. Mm. And so that's, that's the base level to start at. And it's really good to start out there too, because you kind of learn everything of what's going on. You learn by observing, you learn by doing, um, you, you know, a lot of your job is going to be taping receipts, but (laughs) you're going to see everything that happens while you're taping those receipts and how the designers solve problems and how the crew makes that, that thing that needs to happen tomorrow happen. So, right. 
I am such a big proponent. I've talked about it so many times of um, skilled labor. And in some ways, this is a skilled labor job. In mm -hmm. some ways, you don't have to go to college to have this job. Correct. Um, you can just work. Uh, yes. throw yourself into the industry and immerse yourself in it and work your way up, yes. which is a great possibility. Some people aren't meant to go to college. You know, yeah. I, I, it's not for everybody. And it's nice to know that there are places someone can go and just work really hard and achieve. Mm -hmm. And costume design is definitely one of them, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, even some of the other places in the behind the scenes of film and television, you could just apprentice your way up. Exactly. At least to a certain point. You yes. could get to, <laughs> to a certain point. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a huge proponent of trade school uh, education and, and vocational school education. I feel like it is part of the problem with our country is that that is not promoted. It's mm -hmm. in some ways frowned upon, yeah. uh, especially by parents. You know, I can hear a parent in our community where their kid says, I just want to be a costume designer and I don't want to go to college and I just want to start working going, what? No. Okay. I mean, one of my daughter's friends says uh, she's very, very bright girl. She's mm -hmm. like all honors class, straight A student, doesn't want to go to college because she wants to work in film and television. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, her parents are going to have a heart attack. But why? <laughs> Why can't she just start working and at a certain point go, maybe I do need to go to school. I mean, yeah. what does it hurt to work for a year and see. or two and say, yeah. I hate this job. I think I'd rather be an accountant. And then he gets to go to school to be an accountant instead of wasting the money. Yeah, exactly. Why? Exactly. There's 18 ways to skin this cat. You know, you yes. don't have to just do it one way. I'm glad you said that because this is one of those industries. You don't have to go to college yeah. or you don't have to go to college right away. Exactly. You can work and see if you like it and then take the next step. Yeah. I have a lot of friends who started out by just working and then went to grad school. Um, and I've had the opposite too, like with me where I was just in school, did grad school and worked then. And so it, you know, you can come at it from every which way, even people just take a few classes that fit them. You know, there's, there's different ways of attacking it. Um, I would say one thing with the pandemic in mind that would be good if someone's interested is start, you know, there's the aspect of the people who are custom making these things. Like I know how to sew. I know how to sew really well. I don't get to do as much of it as I used to, but I do love it. And it's something that um, you can make a whole career out of in the costume world. Like you don't have to be the designer. You can be the person that makes the designs. You know, there's so many different aspects to our world that it's like, if, if you love sewing right now and it's something that, oh, you want to sew costumes. That is something you can work on right now at home without the pandemic. And there's so many videos on YouTube. There's a lot of different classes going on for it online. It's something that right now with the pandemic, you can start looking into. And the same for people who want to design, learning how to use like programs like Procreate on your iPad to digitally draw costume renderings and designs. Um, that's something that you can be working on right now so that you actually have items in your portfolio when this, when the world opens up again to show right. to the designer so that they'll take you under their wing, you know? Right. right. That's great advice. Really great advice. Actually, now that you said that, I have a friend uh, I was friends with when I lived in New York who lives here now. And all he does is sew costumes. That's mm -hmm. all he does. He just sews. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing stuff. Yeah. And he does it at home. You know, he yeah. just sews costumes all day long. And he started uh, by doing that in New York City and then came out here to do it in this industry. No college degree. We waited yeah. tables together in New York. We were oh, both waiters. Awesome. And uh, he's one of the nicest, most lovely human beings. And all he was, he just wanted to sew. He was like, if I could yeah. sew all day long, every day, I'd be so happy. Yeah. And that's what he does. He just makes yeah. fabulous costumes. As a seamstress, I guess a seamster. He's yeah, we're, we're we're trying to non-gender the uh, how, how do you do right now. We have tailor and seamstress, uh -huh. but like seamstresses tailor and tailors seamstress. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're starting to use the term sewist. Uh, oh, interesting. Terms. But um, professionally in our world, like union-wise and stuff, they're called costume made custom-made costumers. 
Aha. Uh-huh. And that's good. I like using that because that is nice and gender neutral. Yes, <laughs> because, yes, yes. Because even when you think about the terms, tailor, uh-huh. seamstress, uh-huh. they uh-huh. have a different weight to them. They sure do. They have a different panache. <laughs> like they do. And yet... <laughs> It's just gender. It's just so. the same thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Same job, different name. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. so crazy. So, like, seamstress is Taylor and Taylor is seam. So, so custom costume. Custom made costumer. Yeah. Plus custom made costumer. Okay. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming <laughs> today and talking to me Beautiful. about this. I so think this is a really good conversation. Yes, I know. It was wonderful talking with you. It's always nice to talk to you, Jennifer. <laughs> You're such a real yeah. person. We, we could just do it all day. <laughs> all day long. I mean, you know, when when after you left that day on Friday when you helped me with my coat mm-hmm. for this shoot, I was like, she's such a such a real, genuine person that I want to talk to her about her job because I don't think anybody knows what your job is in like a lot the of real people world. Don't. <laughs> like people in, in Kansas may not know what that means. And I find that to be fascinating and an interesting conversation. And you're such a real person. You're so easy to talk to. Thank um, so thank you for being a part of my of podcast. Course. It was so much fun. Being a costumer. <laughs> so cool. What a cool job. Most of the time, except for the poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no more dirty underwear. Okay. No more dirty underwear. Are you working on anything now? Um, not at the moment. Uh, like personal projects of things like stuff that my husband and I were putting together a few things to get ready to shoot. And then I have, um, a photo shoot with Taylor Tomlinson coming up. Oh yeah. She's Um, lovely. Yeah. I love her and adore her. Yeah. She's a lovely person. Her and Bert are two of my favorite people. Cause well, cause you all are so you're just nice and you're all so normal. (laughs) We are really normal. And yeah. respectful and understanding and um, just delightful to work with, you yeah. know. Thank you. That's very oh. sweet. Um, yeah. I know when Bert called, Bert is the person that set you up for me last Friday because I was like, it was like, I found out I was going to do this show and I had like two days to figure out what I was going to wear. And it was probably two of the busier days I've had. Yeah. And I was like, when in the heck? I can't even possibly get to the mall. I don't even know what I'm going to, I just started completely spiraling going, I guess I'll be in my puffy down ski jacket. I mean, that's all I have. And then Bert called you and he was like, nope, I'm just going to hire Jennifer. I don't want you to argue with me because I'm, <laughs> I'm a penny pincher. I'm a cheapy cheap. And I go, surely in my brain, I go, surely I can buy myself a coat. Knowing I don't have time to buy myself a coat. Yeah. But it, I was just so relieved that he did that. He did that, he did that for me. But just go Bert. Take it off. I know. Go Bert. He was absolutely right. And I'm really uh, grateful for it. So thank you for what you did for of me last course. week. And thank you for this. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, this is wonderful. Uh, well, enjoy your day. You too, dear. Have fun. And I'm, I'll see you again soon. Yes, I hope. Soon. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some fancy thing I need styling for again. Right? Exactly. That'll be fun. <laughs> I don't know what it could be in a pandemic. But you I'm never joking know. Though. We have we have this event that should be a red carpet event, mm-hmm. but we don't know if there'll actually be a red carpet. Mm-hmm. But I jokingly said to Bert, we should do our own red carpet. Exactly. We should just do our own. <laughs> Red carpet. So, so maybe we'll have you come over and red carpet our whole family. Exactly. Be fun. You know, zhuzh it up for the camera. Exactly. For our own selfie. <laughs> <laughs> it's all for the Insta, right? It's all for Insta, baby. All for Insta. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Have a good day. 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 Have a good